We're going to start our lunchtime program now. And I want, before we get started, I actually wanted all of us, um, it's great for everyone to continue on with lunch, but can we thank uh, Bloomberg and Valerie Carullo for sponsoring uh, this wonderful paella lunch that we just had? Great. Um, of course, we have with us today Kingsley Martin from KM Standards. He's the CEO and president of that company. He is an entrepreneur with uh, legal experience from both Oxford and Harvard, I think. And one of the things that really uh, makes Kingsley an interesting person for us to be hearing from today is the ABA named a number of legal rebels, um, I think there were 10 or 12 of them, and both Kingsley and John Mayer from Cali, uh, who's actually delayed today, uh, were in that group of legal rebels. So I think Kingsley is going to hopefully tell us some really edgy things and make us think about contracts and what it means to be teaching contracts at this time. So I will leave it to Kingsley. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, could tell from my accident, I'm from Chicago, and it is just a pleasure to enjoy a little bit of warmth weather. It's, thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me, and thank you for the introduction. And it is, it is interesting being a rebel. Um, it's certainly not in the mainstream. I feel that most of my career, I've been hanging on to the furthest branch and the weakest leaf at the end of that tree, trying to sort of understand more and more about contracting, technology, and merging the two together. And actually, I'm going to start with a little story with you. It was actually almost 30 years ago that I graduated from Harvard in the US and went to work for Jones Day. And as a, if I, re I remember distinctly my first assignment, which was to draft a credit agreement. And I had no clue how to do it, not a clue how to start. I had to do it the same way as everyone else which is go around the corridor, bang on some doors, get some examples, and sit down and start to read them. And I assume that my first few attempts, in fact, probably years' worth, were miserable. Miserable attempts. So that's part of what's motivated me to do what you're about to see. Actually, earlier this week, I gave a presentation to a bunch of students at the University of Chicago. And I'm sorry to say, I don't think they're any more prepared to go out and do that job that I did 30 years on than I was so long ago. I asked them three simple questions at the beginning. By show of hands, how many of you in the room are interested in a career in law? 100%. How many of you are interested in technology and combining that in your profession? Zero. How many are you worried by the rise of technology? 100%. I couldn't, I just didn't add up in my mind. So that's part of what I want to show you today. I really want to sort of lay out the technology and the content structures that I hope help us, can help you, and help the students. Because one of the things that was apparent in that room was the fear. The fear that the technology might take away their job. And what I was trying to explain to them, no, there is incredible opportunity. What's happened in the traditional marketplace, it's narrowed to serve the 1%, which is great. Many of my friends are still equity partners at the large law firms, and they have a very satisfying, re financially rewarding life serving the 1%. But that 99% is, in fact, a massive market opportunity. But we may not be able to tackle it in that old-fashioned way, that old rote way of learning. We may have to use technology to help us do it more efficiently. So what I was proposing to them was just to think about the machine itself. We know that technology today is getting ever more powerful. A computer can drive a car. The Google cars are very adept at driving down the road. The real issue is a regulatory legal uh, environment in which for them to operate. A machine can fly an airplane. It, it, can, it can perform brain surgery. So the question I wanted to pose to the students is, can it draft a contract? And I think that's what I want to explore with you today is how far can it go? What can it do? How can it help? And indeed, what are its limits? Now, of course, there's going to be a huge amount of doubt. I mean, lawyers are trained to be skeptics. 
mean, I find in many ways that I've worked in a, in a world of a negative space trying to push some of these ideas ahead. And the basic concept is that although Watson, hope you're aware of it, the IBM machine that first bested the best chess player and then bested the best at the, the TV show game Jeopardy, and now, by the way, is being trained in oncology, and in fact is considered today to be one of the best diagnosticians in oncology. But the thought still is, and this is, uh, many, many people hold this opinion, that Watson still can't think. I think, therefore I am. And this is an article uh, written by Professor uh, Dreyfus. That basically, he wrote a, a book many years ago, Man, Man Over Machine, basically saying that strong AI would never work. But to this, I wrote the, uh, a little comment back to the New York Times saying, but when you measure something by output, what's the difference between intelligence, judgment, and brute force? If he simply does it on the, on the results. And so what I wanted to propose to the audience uh, here and at the University of Chicago students is that, well, what, what are the phases that we're going through so that we can assess the technology in each of these concepts, in each of these stages? The technology mirrors the way that we learn ourselves. And measured from, out, from an output viewpoint, there are three steps that I want a machine, see a machine be able to do when it comes to any form of learning. Stage one is, I want to find the relevant material. Give me the source material for me. Give me the cases, give me the sample contracts so that I can start, as I did as a young lawyer, to start to read them. Now, it's so without a doubt today that this is no longer done in an old-fashioned manual way. For most people, this is done online, whether it be Westlaw, Bloomberg, Google, or anyone else. We now go to a machine to answer that first question. The second question is once I've got the pile of paper, I want to determine the relevant elements, the relevant issues in the case, or the relevant elements of a particular transaction. That's how we learn over time, by reading all of those examples. That's what we do, that's what I will show you in a second. The third and final stage is to determine the optimal outcome, the actual results. And I think this is one of the things I, when often when I show some of this technology, I get a sense and indeed pushback from the crowd is that until you can give me the answer, bother me not. But I was trying to propose to the group that does a surgeon look at an MR, MRI machine as a threat to their pr practice? No, it's a machine to help them practice better. So let me show you some examples. And I thought I'd just start off, ill-advisably, with a live demo. And so hopefully this machine will come up in a second. And I noticed a second ago, it did take a, a moment or two to come up. But what I've got on my screen is a merger agreement that I've taken from Edgar that is 85 pages long. So let me prompt this thing along by quitting out of the PowerPoint. That might help it to speed up here. And here's this merger agreement. It's 85 pages long. I checked a second ago, 31,000 words. I want to be able to review this really quickly. So I'm just going to copy the whole text of this into the clipboard and go to our software. Our software has read in previously just 50 merger agreements as a sample. From that sample set, the software has automatically determined the structure organization of those documents. You see it on the left-hand side. It looks like a table of contents. It shows you all the elements that we see in a merger agreement and how frequently they occur and the consistency of the language on each of those clauses. So 83 pages. Let me take that contract and run an analysis on it. And it will take around, I just previously determined from the wireless here, around 10 seconds to do it. Probably will beat most people reading it. It's already done. It's done its analysis. I'm only going to show you a little piece of it. What we've done here is a table of concordance that on the left-hand side, you see your document. I've done an analysis of it compared to the analysis of the 50 that I ran into the machine. Just to show you just a one quick thing in here, let's open up the reps and warranties. The color coding is uh, critical. The, the clauses that are in black text are found in your document compared to the standard. And the clauses down here that are in red text are in your document, but we don't typically see them. We do not typically see FDA and regulatory matters, and we don't see government inspections. The clauses in blue are missing in your document. So we can use the technology to not only find the elements of a particular contract, but we can compare any given contract 
to that standard at that speed. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. And let's start with the curtain. I chose this purposely because I want to kind of show you behind the scenes. And I chose this on The Wizard of Oz because in all honesty, I pulled back the curtain. The wizard's not that impressive. We can do this. It has, I mean, Dan Katz and others from Michigan State have shown the, the power of quantitative legal prediction. And this, by the way, is a similar pattern of analysis and capability that runs across multiple disciplines, not just law. There are fundamentally two ways to solve problems that we see here. We can do it from the top down. We call it deductive reasoning a la Sherlock Holmes. We can also do it bottom up by looking at all of the elements of the pieces and finding the patterns and organizations and structure from it. We attempted to solve originally the intelligence behind chess or jeopardy or legal analysis through that deductive pattern matching by coming up with the rules, coming up with all of the rules that if it's this, it's that, well, here's an exception, if not, and so on. We didn't solve it. It, it was too complicated. And in many ways, by the way, even a grandmaster doesn't look at the chessboard and see a myriad of potential possibilities, they see one. They see the patterns. The power of that statistical capability has made us, has given us that capability to create Google Translate, to create predictive coding, and to do what we're doing here. It is an inductive technique of analyzing the raw data and building up the patterns from it. What I want to really show you, I don't want to get too much in the technology piece because I know that is still, it's, uh, for many people, it is, it, it is a concern. It is a new field. I want to show that we can use it to be able to come up with better deductive, better ways of structuring contracts by creating contract standards. So the way I want to go about this is to explain to you the technology of contract analysis but to tee it up, more importantly, about creating a means of creating contract standards. So contract analysis for me is the tools to be able to do what I just did, is to be able, like that MRI machine, to be able to see things that I couldn't see, to take a stack of paper, hundreds of, you know, hundreds of documents, and be able to analyze them in minutes and be able to determine what's in those documents and then be able to compare anything to it. And so going through those three steps, I can show you where we are and what are the capabilities today. So step one, find the relevant material. Doesn't matter whether it's on Edgar, whether it's on Google, we can pretty quickly pull together employment agreements, license agreements, anything that's in the public domain. And yes, I'll be happy to have a conversation both about copyright and data privacy issues that come from this. But I'm more focused right now on the ability to be able to run the analysis. So we can pull out of it all of those documents. And indeed, the interesting thing about it, I don't even need to be that accurate in being able to do it because the next stage are automatically going to filter out of these documents the pieces that I want. Or oh, I'll also sometimes get pushback from people that, well, don't you have a problem about garbage in and garbage out? No, not really, because in all, in all of our learning, we take information from a variety of places. And Watson, the Jeopardy play machine, was of course criticized because you know, it was using, by the way, mostly Wikipedia and Google. It, like us, has the ability to filter. We take a variety of inputs and we can filter out the irrelevant. So we don't actually even need to cherry pick. We can put them all in there and then use the systems to come up with the best result. What we then do is deconstruct them. And a lot of what this whole environment is about is about deconstructing and rebuilding. So the next step will be to take all of those employment agreements and deconstruct them into their individual clauses. By the way, I used to do this manually. At a law firm, when I, I would go there and I would create standards of wills and trusts and license agreements, and in the good old days, I would go to the partners and I'd ask them for all their templates. And I remember the first one sitting in a cubicle, it was depressing. This pile was two feet high. And I knew I was going to have to read these things multiple times in order to be able to come up with a good standard. And by the way, my technique was print the whole thing out, look at the pile, pull the fattest document from the pile, because it probably had the most clauses in it, then serially go through the pile and write down the names of the clauses I hadn't seen before, 
try and organize those clauses in some kind of logical manner, then go through the pile for every single clause and come up with the standard language and all the variations of that clause. Often the only way to do it was to lay the pieces of paper out on my, the floor of the office and try and play some kind of game of palmanism of a memory game. This would take months. I mean, it's part of the reason we've not been able to do very much with the technology, whether it be document assembly or, or analysis, in order to come up with that template. For me, something like a will would take me three months to be able to feel comfortable sitting down and doing that. And what you just saw was me doing that on a, uh, on a merger agreement in just a few seconds. So here, for example, is an analysis of an employment agreement. And what we do then is do what I used to do manually, but have wrote software to be able to do it. So aggregate, say, 50, 100, 250 employment agreements into one common structure. I mean, it looks like a table of contents, all of the clauses that I would expect to see in an employment agreement. The definitions, terms of employment, compensation, base salary. It's fundamentally the checklist. And in fact, there's one of these sort of interesting sort of tensions and pushbacks I get from practitioners is they want to focus on the minutiae of the words, focusing on the details of particular principles, whilst in many cases I look at contracts that are missing key terms. The checklist is fundamental, one of the most important things that we, in law firms that I work at, very, very few of them have a checklist. What I'm more actually in some ways impressed with is looking at a merger agreement that those lawyers are playing a memory game they actually do remember, for, for the most part, every single clause that should be in there. Or, n even more problematic, not only things that they might have missed, and sadly we do think things, the same clause occurring multiple times in the same contract. You know, my favorite one being the further assurances clause, which you can see in some cases in the covenants, in some cases in the general or miscellaneous provisions, and in most cases they'll say something different. In this situation, what we then do is, that, again, we bring in some statistics. And sadly, there may, as Dan says, Dan Katz says, there might be math on the test. But the math is not that difficult, in all honesty. We look at each of those clauses in the documents that we found, and we measure them in terms of commonality or frequency. And now it becomes quite apparent. Again, we're working at this second phase. We don't know the answers. We just know the pieces. But we know which pieces occur in most of them, Think of them as required. And we know which pieces appear in some, but not all. They're obviously optional. They're obviously deal specific. So in this particular case, I'm going to see a base salary clause in every single employment agreement. I see an overtime clause in a small percentage. And I can start to turn that around into a question, when would you use an overtime clause? Well, when it's an hourly employee. I will see a signing bonus if I just take a bunch of documents off Edgar in approximately 10% 10, 10 of them. So again, I know that it is optional to be used in certain circumstances. So it's very quick and very easy to be able to determine this checklist, which are required, which are optional. And again, it can't tell you when to use them, but it can at least give you guidance whether you've got it in your document. The other piece that we do is that we look at every single clause in that set of documents. And I think of that first structure as being vertical. What is the vertical organization of the document? And then each one of those clauses, I want to compare that language across all of them. And again, using the power of statistics, what we're looking for, just as I did when I did it manually, the first thing I want to know is the baseline. I want to know what is the most standard way of drafting this clause. It doesn't mean it's neutral. We can go across from you know, a, an employment agreement which is going to be slightly favorable to the employer, depending upon the grade, to something like an end-user license agreement that's going to be very favorable to the licensor. And within that relative space, we can find the most standard way of drafting any of the clauses. It, again, is an incredibly simple uh, statistical formula that is really Find me the sum of the most common words over the divergent words. Find me the clause example that com contains most standard terms and the least divergent terms. Magically, you will find the example. And then we can stack up all of the other uh, clauses in this set and be able to see how, how common or divergent they are. So we can see ones that contain all of the standard terms, but increasing amounts of deal-specific or divergent terms. 
and we can see the clauses that are missing some of the key terms. Where we're going next with this, by the way, is not just to simply identify, but to do a deeper analysis. Because it is also clear that there are elements to these clauses, and there are, as I'll show in a second, different components and different sand standards to the clauses. And again, because of the way that we buried all this language in very long, complex, not broken up, compound uh, paragraphs, it's very hard to pull out the scope from the standards from the descriptive pieces. We can show you how better to do that. So really what we end up then with is, a, is an analysis of a document with these two statistical overlays to it. One looking at frequency or commonality to show you all of the building blocks and the elements that appear frequently and those that appear uncommonly and the language consistency across all of it. We can actually use that, by the way, to go further and look at clauses and start to group them into clauses that are common and consistent, they're standard or boilerplate. Clauses that are common but different from one contract to another, well, they're typically negotiated or they're just different because of circumstance or preference. Clauses that are uncommon but really the same when we see them, they're deal-specific markers. And clauses that are different but infrequently occur. Those are obviously just completely you know, one-off deal ones. So it gives us the tools to be able to do it. This is where we are today. And when I think of that continuum of find the relevant material to next identify the relevant elements, the last stage is, well, is it possible for us to be able to configure that contract and be able to determine the optimal outcome? Well, I kicked around in my mind, and one of the many crazy ideas that uh, I have floating back in there is to follow something like DARPA. DARPA has done a series of challenges. The first challenge they did was the, the autonomous cars in three rounds. The first round was in a closed circuit. Most of the cars failed. The second round was around the desert, 150 mile circuit. Most of, them, most of them succeeded at high speed and the last one, of course, was in traffic. DARPA is now doing a new robotic challenge. I think it's got eight different tests in it uh, on things like mechanical things like open a series of doors, which by the way is hybrid robot, uh, clean up a space, drive a car. Well, what about a contract challenge? I mean, I, what I imagine is, can we actually put this to the test? And what I'm imagining is, first, first round is draft a clause. I think we'll do fine. The second is draft a contract, and the third will be negotiate one. <laughs> so what, what, what would we have to do to get to that third stage? And I don't know if this is possible, and I'll explain why. I think technically we have the means to do it, and increasingly we're going to have the computer power to do it but I don't know if it's still going to be, the results are going to be satisfactory. What we can do is in addition to pulling out those clauses, the components, we can also pull out all of the deal elements. The deal elements typically exist in the names, the dates, or the amounts, the triggers, the percentages. And what we increasingly do is not just sort of pull out the legal language, but we pull out, and this is where the data privacy stuff comes in, we can pull out from Edgar, we can pinpoint the salary we can pinpoint the period of non-compete. And if you stack up all of those deal terms, aren't those the drivers to drafting the contract? This is a mid-cap, high-tech company based in Palo Alto um, that is being purchased by such and such. I just need a certain deal point and I can go into Edgar and bring up all of the prior ones and be able to compare it to it. Now the that is how, how the, problem, the big data problem is going to be solved. Whether there is statistical relevance, this is what I, what I query for two reasons. A, law is not really big data. I mean, even if we go to, to Edgar, I mean, I, we can pull easily a few, a few hundred thousand employment agreements, but for many, there aren't that many. And within a law firm, we often find just a bare handful. The second one's more interesting is, can we truly detect statistical correlation? I've run, run a few tests, and the results come out as you imagine. That, for example, with a large Canadian bank, they wanted to standardize a non-disclosure agreement. They bought a number of companies, they were operating across different uh, jurisdictions, and they wanted to be able to harmonize them into one. They tried to do it the old-fashioned way by assigning it to someone, but they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it for a variety of reasons. They just couldn't get their mind around, I'm going to assert the standard for the firm. The, the, whole, the whole business. So we just ran it statistically. We data mined their existing documents and pulled for them the de facto standard. 
But I asked them at the beginning two things. You want to determine if these contracts are different by jurisdiction. Fine, we can assess that. But I'll also ask you for one other piece of information. Would you give me the name of the author who wrote it? Because I'm pretty sure that what we find, and as we did in fact prove, a limited link association to jurisdiction and a 100% correlation to authorship. Where will we get to this point in those three continuums? I really do feel that uh, the uh, quantitative legal prediction, what we're really working on right now, this element analysis, is really gonna be the focus of the current decade. With the power of technology, I mean, it is really getting unbelievably powerful. I mean, I just think of your cell phone as you know, the capability of that machine. Think of the fact that in just a few years from now, a supercomputer will reach a petaflop a petaflop is 10 to the 18 floating point operations a second, a billion billion. It's about what we have up here in a few years. A few more years after that, that same computer will have the computing, computing capacity of everyone on the planet. And a few years after that, it'll have the computing capacity of everyone who ever lived. So in the time frame that I'm talking about in the next couple of decades, we're gonna have unbelievable computing capacity. That's without a doubt. Whether I say we can find these correlations, I think, is, is more of a, an open question. But we can use this in ways today that I think, hopefully, can help the education. And what I would like to propose and really focus on in the last piece of this is to think about contract standards. It is very clear when you look at this empirically that there are standard building blocks to contracts. There is a recipe, a standard recipe for building an employment agreement, for licensing software, for buying, for buying a company. And indeed, as a client of law firms, I'd rather them use the recipe than come up with something creative and different. I want it to be done. I want it known within the risk factors. I also had the opportunity to work on the corporate side where we were dealing with hundreds of contracts and having to live within them and manage them. If every single one were different, it's a nightmare from our side. So just to give you some examples, I mean, if we can just run norms, a non-disclosure agreement, we see these same patterns. We know that the boilerplate, the general provisions are similar, but so is much of the rest of the document. The terms, the, uh, the representations, the covenants, the indemnities. This is an employment agreement, running a few hundred of them. We see these same building blocks over and over again. Yes, they are going to differ in their individual components, but often within a range of known variability or even a merger agreement. And here's one of the more interesting things that we've discovered in this process. I can make a counterintuitive but completely accurate statement. The more sophisticated the transaction, the more standard the document is today. A merger agreement, while much more complex than an employment or a license agreement, is far more standard in its structure. That's the reason why I could, at the beginning, take a merger agreement, just randomly off Edgar, and benchmark it, and find those same pieces over and over again. Now, I puzzled originally, is that how could that be? How could merger agreements be more conforming than an employment agreement? Well, first, first you think about, well, more sharing, ability to go to Edgar, to other databases and pull and reuse them. Yes, but you can do the same with the others. Now, I think the reason is this. The universe of lawyers that draft merger agreements is far smaller than the universe of lawyers that draft employment agreements, some of whom are not lawyers. So we know that there are patents. And unlike my joy of trying to learn that credit agreement you know, on the fly as a young lawyer and trying to work my way through it, we know that those patents exist from one to another, and we can teach and I'm pretty sure that today I can teach someone contracting fairly quickly. And the way I go about it is thinking about hierarchies. You know, pulling from the you know, work of someone like Herbert Simon. And that this hierarchy that I see is composed of deconstruction of all of these contracts that we're using, first creating a framework. I need to have a background against which to look at all of these contracts, a standard concept of a contract. I want to be able to look at all of those checklists that I just showed you, and I want to be able to look at the clause language and get down to the absolute details and the minutia of each of the pieces in here. Now, as we go through each of these different types of agreements, we're seeing different frameworks. But one of the ones that I find completely reoccurring, sorry about the black on the dark colors, 
um, is a contract standard framework. I'm hoping to be able to use this in a variety of contexts to be able to explain contracting, not just to lawyers, but to business people. And what we see in this framework of exchange agreements, and I say we can do different frameworks for organizational documents, distribution documents have different frameworks, but this is one of the most common. I see in this framework, it handles most forms of exchange agreements, which I put into three main categories. There is purchases, licenses, and performance agreements. A purchase, of course, an asset purchase agreement, a merger, or the purchase of real estate is essentially the acquisition of that, that, uh, that, 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 that asset for one-off. Whereas a license, I think, is a very, is a very fluid uh, concept. I can think of a license not just in technology, but I can think of licensing property and calling it a lease. I think of licensing money, and I call it a loan. So within this, we have a concept of bargain, an exchange of rights, interest, and property. We have a methodology of exchange. How are we going to do it? Are we going to do it at closing? Are we going to do it over a series of installments? Um, how long is this obligation going to go on? That's very much what I think is the, the businessman, the back of the envelope often is that first piece. The second layer, I think of the statements, the conditions, and the obligations. The statements we would typically think of as being the representations, but I also think of them as the acknowledgments too. You acknowledge that you're licensing this software from me, I continue to own it. The conditions we typically think are things you must do prior to actually the transaction or closing, and the obligations you think of as the covenants. And then the, third, the bottom line is rights, remedies, and enforcements. Now one of the things I've been uh, trying to work on is an economic theory of this too. If all contracts are basically an expression of an economic exchange, then all elements of that contract must also be, be, be essentially can be valued. But it's very clear that the top line has a one-to-one -one correlation. The bottom line, where the lawyers operate, obviously it has also some kind of probability of whether or not it comes into play. So one way we can play the game is that if I were selling a car to you, you would have a, an, a, a clear understanding of the value of that car, maybe by going to the blue book. If I were to give you a warranty, you would have an ability to be able to think about the value of it, even though it's conditional upon perhaps exercising that warranty. But by the same token, if you would pay a few thousand dollars for a warranty on a used car, how much would you pay for an entire agreement clause? How much would you pay for a governing law clause? Well, it'd be one thing if it were Florida, what happens if it were Iraq? So we, can, we, have a, we have not only a sort of a probabilistic thing in the, in the bottom line, but the other thing that Tim Cummings, I hope you've come across the work of Tim and the IACCM, the International Association of Contract Managers, one of the things that he's pointed out is that lawyers spend their time on the bottom line, businessmen focus on the top line, and there's very little communication between the two. So one of the things that we're seeking to do through contract standards is to be able to make this clearer. And so as we go through this, really what it is to me is that it is a deconstructive breakdown through those three main pieces. The frameworks themselves, the contract checklists, and then the clauses. And most of this can be taught. And in fact, a lot of the work that we do is not only within uh, using US trained attorneys, but we, we outsource too. And so we have to teach people from overseas how to be able to re read and review, analyze and audit agreements. And I found that being able to do this breakdown is a very useful technique. That for example, we, we think of the, the framework breaking down as a series of action items. But in terms of the exchange, what I want to know is what? What's included and what's excluded? And it's remarkable, even with that really simple thing, I can't tell you how many asset purchase agreements, all of them have got the assets that are being purchased. Most of them have what's not included, a smaller percentage itemize what liabilities you're going to assume, and very few think about the, the, the liabilities that you do not assume. So each one of these, at some level, very, very simple, but if you simply follow this methodology, you can sort of think of the questions you need to ask yourself as a lawyer, student, or other going through this contract. What can you do? What can't you do? Think about that in the software license. I license it to use it, and you may install it on your computer and your home computer. But you cannot 
sell it to other people. You cannot reverse engineer it. So we need to just think through this. When? When is this going to happen? How long is this going to go on for? In the case of the obligations, what can you do? What must you do? What will you do? What, what will you not do? Again, is we can think of these in terms of very business-like uh, ways and be able to sort of understand this. I think of this as being able to see the forest for the trees. We, that was my problem when I was a young lawyer. I couldn't understand this thing from the minutia of the words. Besides, reading those paragraphs that were a page long, that was hard enough in itself, let alone step back and say, what's happening in the deal here? And then, of course, we have the rights, the remedies, the essential what-ifs. The second piece, as I sort of kind of already alluded to, is we go to the agreements themselves, we can look at that analysis, that matrix structure of these documents, and be able to look at all of the components in here, and it sets up this very simple matrix that we use all the time to be able to review and audit any set of documents. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna find some clauses in here, like the governing law clause, the amendment clause, that are really common and, and consistent. They're standard. Again, there's a range from them, but I can go in and I can look at them really quickly and find the range of them, not laying the stuff out on the floor of my office. The second one I think is really interesting is that there are clauses that are very common, but they are different one to another. Now, I say some of these are going to be things like the bonus, which are highly negotiated, but I can also, just as I can with contracts as a whole, it's quite remarkable, we can predict with very great accuracy any clause in the contract as to how conforming it's going to be. An amendment clause is really conforming. Why is an entire agreement clause really different from one to another? And yet, predictably, we can see that pattern over and over again. I know that looking at most complex agreements, the first five reps and warranties are usually the most uh, non-conforming. Now, in that case, I can understand why. It's because lawyers aren't consistent in joining different pieces together. We might say, I have the authority and the right to enter into this agreement, and this is valid and enforceable. So you, have, you, you create these compound different clauses, and you bring multiple things together, and every single one does it differently. But we say, you can also see, I mean, it just shocks me when I go to a law firm, and I pull all of their documents, and I find something like an amendment clause, or the entire agreement clause to me is now predictable, that no two examples from that firm are the same. It's just shocking. Do they have no templates, no standards? Or if they do, does someone come here and tinker with it every time? <laughs> there must be situations in which we can configure them from this more high level. But again, I think this is fundamentally the sort of the, the disconnect and pullback, pushback with the technology. The lawyers do want to focus on the words. I'm also saying, I agree with you. You must do that. But at the same time, think about the checklist, the business terms, the construct of what you're trying to build. But even within the words, I mean, I just put this one up, and I have to read some of the two. I just wanted to show you something that's just, just dense, and yet, in itself, it's really simple. It is a position and duties clause that I took from an employment agreement. And the top line says the obvious, the company agrees to employ the executive for the term of this agreement as senior vice president and CFO. And then I picked this one because I, I, I love the included but not limited twos. I mean, some of them, they can just go on forever. It's almost as if the lawyers are playing this sort of game of, uh, you know, they've got Roget's the thesaurus in front of them. How many can they get down? And I'm not sure that in most cases I can't just strike them without changing the meaning. meaning. But because of that, I mean, what, are, what concerns me, now we can't, I can't engage a conversation with a draftsman here, but I have a deep suspect, the suspicion that a lot of effort went into those words. But again, at the level of detail that the draft person couldn't step back, and there is at the bottom, I'm gonna have to read to you the line that says, the last one says, the executive hereby accepts such employment and agrees faithfully to perform to the best of his duties the, the, the duties described in section 1A, faithfully. Which is to me a very interesting example because one of the very first uh, assignments I offshored to India was an, em an employment agreement and I was trying to teach them deconstruction. And one of the things that we tried to do, as I'll show you in a second, is that we're trying to always write in clear, standard English. Use the least amount of words that, gets the, that captures the concept that you want. So they looked at a whole bunch of employment agreements and what they found was faithfully, diligently, and competently. And because they knew that I wanted it nice and short, 
the clause came back, the executive shall perform his or her duties efficiently. <laughs> and, it's like, and you know it's like, oh, that's a glaring, glaring error. It's like almost jars at you. Because you knew that they, what they had done there is essentially stepped on a standard. And they weren't aware of it. But we could show them it was very easy to go back into the software and say, no, you can't do that. That's a standard. And in fact, if you went back into the collection of these clauses and saw how many times the word efficiently was used, you would see zero. But if you looked in those clauses and you found how many times faithfully and diligently occurred, you would see nearly 100%. And the words appeared very close to one another. They were a legal term of art and standard. But now you could also take a look at the peripheral pieces. So what we began to see was that there were two other pieces that sat side by side to it. One was a modifier of competence, and the other was a modifier of best efforts. And just looking at it, it just became fairly clear and easy for us to establish the standard to say, faithful and diligently is the midpoint of this plumb line. That's the norm. If I want to measure this position in terms of standard practices, I'll use the word competently. And if I want to measure it to the capability of the individual, I'll use best efforts. And these are critical things. Because if I hire someone and use best efforts, and they fail to meet what I consider to be norms, I can't fire them. They did their best. But that's what I wonder is that while we focus on the, all of these words, we've buried some of these concepts and standards inside of here, and we haven't made them clear. Can we use the software like that MRI machine to go into these things and be able to make it clearer what the possibilities are? The machine cannot tell you which one to use but it can give you the material to, for you to exercise the judgment, uh, I, I think, much, much better than simply burying through lengthy clauses like that. So what we do, and what we're, this is where I'm actually in the software right now trying to design the code around. I do spend far more time now writing code than I do spend writing contracts. Um, it's sort of the methodology of how to get here is that one of the key pieces that we do is to decompose the clauses into unitary elements. I, again, I get this lot of pushback that do you really understand the nuances of will, shall, and must? Do you understand the need for ambiguity? Yes, I think there's need for ambiguity in situations where the future is unknown and we need to essentially give us flexibility. But I don't think it's defensible to write a complex clause that's open to five different interpretations. That doesn't serve the ultimate client very well. So what I'm trying to do programmatically, looking at these things, is sort of break the clauses down into these four main pieces. What's the statement? What's it covering? The position shall be. The sort of the, and write that in the clearest, plainest English. The coverage piece. The included but not limited to's. Well, the question I sometimes get from a presentation like this, does your software understand the subtleties of eustem generis? Yes, well, it, it can't give you the answer to it, but it can certainly tell you that given any term, I will give you all of the likely synonyms, and in mathematical terms, I'll give you the vectors. If you want to use the word family, I will tell you all of the common terms that will be used from that in, in order of likely uh, utility. That third piece, the standards, I think are the most interesting ones. So be able to, uh, for example, can we programmatically determine com commercially reasonable best efforts in a merger agreement? Can we look at all of the different ways that it can be done? And that's really where we are today. And then the, that last piece, I think of the, the variables as being the names, the dates, the amounts, the ability to pull out the non-competes, the triggers, the percentages, et cetera, is where we're also going in this area. So this is what we're trying to do today, is essentially give the lawyer this contract standards capability to be able to look at each of the clauses in here, be able to create all the different elements, give them the choices, and it shouldn't be too hard to be able to weight those choices in terms of bias. So I've actually written some software where you can bring up an employment agreement with a simple slider, just say with your finger, I'd like this to be weighted towards the employer, or I'd like this to be favorable to the employee. Because we can set all of those different ones. We can make them transparent, we can make them clear, and I think that anyone could simply, uh, I usually use a five point scale. So faithful and diligent, that gets the midpoint, three. Uh, best efforts, slightly favorable to the employee. Competently, slightly favorable to the employer. And then you know, just with that, you can just run it into the software and we will be able to essentially you know, do that analysis for you. 
So I was thinking in terms of the curriculum. So what would it look like? Well, I've wrote it down, but I, as soon as I wrote this down, I realized you're doing this today. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing new in here in thinking of really, I think the contract frameworks might be a more useful way of explaining a contract as opposed to consideration. You would actually be able to, to go from the class and actually write a contract because I use an example with the students about you know, a contract for the sale of a used car. And I was pretty sure that not one of them could write that contract. Key contract terms in terms of you know, securing, thinking in terms of the businessman, securing the bargain, protecting the bargain, enforcing it. Techniques of drafting and negotiation. But I wanted to do something more than that, and this is what I'd like to, to, to leave you with a thought. Um, I think of these, so another one of the, the crazy ideas, but the, the thing about this one is that it's doable. Now, if you know me, I have a concept of doable. I, I love long distance hiking, uh, challenging hiking. We have a concept of a doable hike, which is just this side of life threatening. Uh, I, I, just did, I just did one in Cornwall where in a, in, a, in a force 10 gale, we walked along 250 foot cliffs in near 100 mile an hour wind. It was doable and it was fantastic. <laughs> so what I have is, well, can we do this? Can we turn this in a way, can we make teaching fun? Can we turn it into a game? Because what we could do here, because the framework that I laid out for you could be a board, like Monopoly. And on the top line of that board, we got the bargain, we got the exchange, we got the term. The clauses that we've been building, you can think of them as the cards that we could put onto that board. Now, the hard thing, I'm still struggling with this, and it'll be a, a, a great way to think about the economics of this. In any game, we want to win. So what, is the, what are the sort of ways that we measure success? And I don't think there's an objective win. There isn't in the contract. It's simply, if I'm buying that used car, I just want to say is that is the price and the terms within my, my risk reward? range. So I think it's something along the lines of how do I maximize my contract value, which could be different from the other sides, and mitigate my risk. And what I'm thinking of that we can do here is we can create these cards. And we can use them to actually run scenarios. So we could, we could create a pre-created pre deck of cards for all of these clauses. But here's the fun thing. We don't have to give all of the cards to everyone. We could hold a few back and see if, see if people would, would deduce it. So for example, what we could do in this scenario, and I like the idea of a, a used car, and we would do it in three different steps with different audiences. We might run this with first years, third years, and maybe B school grads. And in the first round, what we would say is that the instructor would lead the first round and say, we're gonna sell, we're simply gonna sell a used car for cash. So what are the clauses you want? You could probably go to Google and get a simple uh, deed to, 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 to sell the car. But the second two scenario that you have the students work on, you work them work on opposite side, would be I will lease you the car, and the second one is I will finance the car. So I want you to be able to work out essentially all the different pieces and parts and the clauses you need for this. That for example, if I were to lease you the car, am I gonna give you the title with the keys? If I'm gonna finance the car, would you expect to get the title? In the case of the sort of obligations, if I am going to uh, uh, finance the car to you, am I going to ask you to maintain insurance? Well, most definitely. Well, let's see if they can work it out. So what I wanted to do then, so this is, I would love to come up with a way, working together with anyone, any of the law schools in here, to develop this. The technology is not hard to do this. I mean, building that, that game, game board, is not difficult, and indeed, I built it in, uh, it doesn't take, it's not that hard to do. And I thought it would also do this. This is a, um, a touch screen. It would make this a bit like, I never saw the movie, The Minority Report. Um, but there's the board. And what we could do in this, this game, what we would then do is with the cards, I know it's just cut off on the left-hand side, we could build a series of cards and we could actually, the, the game has to be done so that anyone can build a card themselves. So the cards are here on the left-hand side. And what we would then set up in here, for example, we're gonna say that, again, just using my finger, we're gonna say that in this bargain, the property is a used car, which I could exchange for, say, services, but let's say we're gonna exchange this for cash. Now, by the way, you can imagine in the future, you can build a contract like this. 
And then I want to think then in terms of the exchange, I'm going to deliver you the cars in return for payment. Or, and then I want to think about all of the, uh, the adjudication pieces. If we need a governing law clause, we're going to need a counterparts clause, and so on and so forth. This is not hard to do. And we could then say set up these different, different scenarios. I think the only missing piece in here is to work together to create the cards or the contract standards. We've gone a long way to do that. I have a website called contractstandards.com that has a large number of these, 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 these pre-built ones. But we could go through all of the others and do it. And the reason why I think it is so doable is this. I've been asked over the years, I mean, how many contracts do you think you're ultimately going to have to sort of program? Well, I think the answer is probably around 500. How many clauses do you, expect, do you think are in each one of those documents? Maybe 40. But how many occur in others? Most of them. So what is the universe, a total number of cards? It's got to be less than 5,000. I mean, collectively, we could actually create contract standards. I think not only could you do that as a teaching tool, I think it's an incredible potential export. I mean, the, the, the emerging world is looking at thinking of uh, contracts as being essentially the, the way that we document our business relationships. And we in the, in the Anglo-American space have been doing this for hundreds of years. This is all documented. It's something that I think we can really pull together. So I'd offer it to basically, I would say, is that if anyone wants to use the software, I will make it available to any of the schools for free. I'll work with you to do it. So that's my time, and thank you very much. There is no easy answer to that. I have to, I have to agree with you at some level, but at the same time, I, it's a very hard question. I, as a tool today, it is the MRI machine. Uh, it is not actually going to do the work. It helps the students get to that point of capability far quicker. But it has to be said that it is doing the work. And as you, as you go up through my three stages, as you think of stage one is finding the stuff, well, that was probably the library, the contract attorney. The second stage of finding the elements, the associate, and potentially if we can get there, that third stage of optimizing the result, the partner. But the, one of the things that I sort of rest, I hope this is true, that this has happened to many professions. It's, it's law is late to the game. We still have doctors, we still have realtors. All of the professions still exist. And I think the one thing that I am comfortable knowing is that lawyers are really smart and will adapt. I think that they will hopefully take this to take their capabilities from the 1% to the 99%. That the computer cannot fully replace the judgment of lawyers. 
Is that correct? The computer cannot fully, the computer cannot fully replace the judgment of lawyers. Well, that's what I think. Yes, no, I, th I agree with you. And I'd rather that we have this conversation than think, think of it as this us versus them. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think we have time for, for one more. Okay. One more question. Okay. I'll give you the completely honest answer, don't blog this. <laughs> don't blog this. I, uh, I did in fact do that. In fact, I started doing exactly that. The, what got me to do this was thinking about plagiarism software. And I was working at the time for Thomson Reuters. And I typed into the raw search engine something like, um, buyer shall hold seller harmless from all lost costs and expense, and came back. As a deal lawyer, I thought, there's nothing on Westlaw that could ever help me, and came back with this wealth of information. And if I very quickly learned that, of course, that wasn't uh, specific enough to include things like attorney's fees. So absolutely you can, and it's actually, we can key it from these systems directly into primary law and secondary law. I, I know it possible. I happen to do it as an employee of my former employer, so I haven't touched it since. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. I have a couple of announcements before we all head off to other sessions. First, if you haven't registered and gotten your name badge and finished your registration, um, please see the table before you head on out for the afternoon sessions. The second announcement is Kingsley will actually be participating in the Teaching in the Digital Age panel this afternoon. If you'd like to hear more about technology and contracts and how it might affect the way that we're educating our students. Um, also this afternoon, we, we had two classrooms that we were using this morning. Uh, this afternoon, we will actually have three classrooms. So it'll be still the same two we had this morning, but there will be one classroom back in the main law school building upstairs, and it's room 219. But everyone here is very friendly, and they'll help you find it. Um, and then the, the last comment is I know that there was some uh, issues with the shuttle coming from Shula's this morning that should be uh, fixed by this afternoon. The shuttles will run again from 2.30 to 5.30 this afternoon from the law school, kind of on a looping basis. But the dinner, sh the dinner shuttles are running only from Shula's and they'll leave at 5.25 and probably 5.30 and 5.35. We're all trying to get um, to the Rusty Pelican by sundown, which is actually 618 or so they tell me today. Um, so please try and get on the shuttles. Uh, they will fill up. I think we have just enough spots. It is going to be quite lovely. Obviously the weather has been fantastic. And so, but remember that um, for those of you staying at the Newport Beach Hotel, there will be a shuttle coming back from Shula's that will take people to the Newport Beach but going to dinner, you need to take one of the shuttles from here over to Shula's to get the dinner shuttle. 
And before we all leave, I actually wanted to introduce Cece Dykus, who is the Associate Dean here at the law school. I think she just wanted to say hello. Enjoy your afternoon, and if I don't see you at the panels this afternoon, I hope to see you all at dinner tonight.